Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to this talk by Ian Walker, our staff, um, and we'll be talking about a variety of changes, that new things that have happened um, in ventilation uh, since since the COVID pandemic. Ian, I'm going to hand it right over to you. Uh, uh, th thanks a lot, Janie. So um, this is, for some of you, you probably heard me talk last year about what's new in ventilation. So this is basically the 2021 edition of that. But I wanted to start out by a quick overview of what we talked about a year ago and what, what were our concerns. And primarily I was talking about residential ventilation because that's my main field of expertise. But a lot of this applies to um, other building types too. Uh, for example, in recent years, we've known more about exactly what contaminants in the air are contaminants of concern for health. Uh, primarily, this is uh, particles, um, NO2 and formaldehyde. Um, we talked about ventilation standards, and I know that you heard more about that um, earlier today uh, from a previous speaker, um, talking about, you know, what's minimally acceptable indoor air quality and that, you know, commissioning is really important and you need to label things properly, people are going to use them properly. We learned that if you can do some smart things about time shifting ventilation, there's some good economic and energy reasons to do so, which without compromising uh, indoor air quality. Talked a bit about cooking and range of performance. And uh, here at LBL, we developed a capture efficiency rating that um, is shortly to be uh, adopted starting out here in California. There are low cost consumer monitors that are pretty good at measuring particles these days. And uh, lastly, there's, we're still lagging behind in, in multifamily buildings. A lot of office spaces and homes have sort of been the focus of a lot of indoor air quality stuff and sometimes industrial environments, but not so much in multifamily. So that's what we talked about last year and all those things are still true, but some things changed in uh, the last year. The primary one was COVID-19 and I will be talking about half of my talk will be on uh, COVID-19 today. And out in the Western part of the country, we had a very, very bad wildfire season and my colleague, Dr. Woody Delp, will talk about that in detail. Um, in the talk uh, later today, possibly following this one. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about something I hinted at last time, which is we've actually been out in the field measuring indoor air quality in a lot of homes. And we have some interesting results from that. Something that's become, uh, that has popped up on our radar for indoor air quality that initially was about um, reducing CO2 emissions, which is all about building electrification, whether that's new construction or when buildings are getting upgraded, removing fossil fuel, burning appliances, for example. And what are the implications for ventilation health and IAQ? And there are some positive ones there that I will uh, discuss. And lastly, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that topic that was at the end of last year's session, which was about talking about kitchen ventilation and what sort of new requirements are we gonna have for, for domestic kitchens uh, coming in the future. But let's start out with um, an overview of COVID-19 and why we care about it from a ventilation perspective. I, I know you've heard some of this today already, so I will, be, I will be brief in my remarks and bear in mind, I am not a medical doctor, so I'm not gonna give anybody any medical advice whatsoever. I'm just gonna talk about how the world of ventilation relates to the world of, of COVID-19. So a little bit of background. You, we probably mostly know that the disease is transmitted by, um, by a virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and this disease can be transmitted through the air. It's initially a respiratory infection, in other words, you breathe the virus in, and that's the site of infection, although um, the, uh, the actual effects and the symptoms can spread to the rest of your body. And you're breathing in viruses that are generally in droplets and particles in the air rather than individual viruses. And that's important because individual viruses are very, very small, but the droplets and particles are bigger and we can do something about it, particularly from a ventilation and filtration point of view. Um, you, the, the, when people exhale air, these particles are in the air. Um, the closer you are to somebody, the more of that exhausted air you breathe, it kind of makes common sense. And the, the little illustration I have there sort of illustrating some of these points I'm making, um, but this, this bullet here, this is why we tell people to stay two meters or six feet apart. Um, it sort of gets you out of that zone where you're directly breathing in exhaled air and it hasn't had a chance to mix or get diluted. It's a, it really is important to know that masks significantly reduce the emissions, either by trapping the particles themselves or reducing how far they go into a room. 
One of the main challenges with COVID-19 is that there's a long incubation period where people don't show symptoms. It's typically about five days. And um, the current sort of medical opinion, and again, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm just passing on what I've read and what my colleagues in the ventilation and COVID world uh, know about is that uh, patients tend to be most infectious prior to symptoms. And that's why it's been such a struggle for us as a society to deal with because uh, the infections are mostly spread by people who don't even themselves know that they are sick. Practically all transmission happens indoors and this is why it's a ventilation related topic. And finally, as you can expect, uh, we know the risks are higher when there are more people in a space or a space is less ventilated. And so what's the, what's the building's role in all of this? I'm not gonna talk about any medical interventions or anything like that. I'm gonna strictly talk about ventilation in buildings here. And we, we have three sort of basic principles. One is about what I would call source control and isolation. You isolate infected people so they can't infect others. And similarly, uh, sensitive people, particularly the elderly, should be isolated. Um, we like this idea of you exhausting contaminated rooms so you're removing the contaminants directly. Again, this would be reversed if you're trying to provide a safe space for sensitive people where you would actually supply fresh outdoor air to it. And the reason for this is we want to maintain some sort of airflow direction from uncontaminated rooms to contaminated rooms to outside. So that, that direction of airflow is important. And that's why when we are thinking about ventilation, we keep that in mind. And of course, wearing masks is a good way to control sources. Um, strictly speaking, the, only the second bullet is about ventilation, but these are all interrelated. Basically more ventilation, uh, bringing, bringing outside air in, lowers the concentrations of virus in the air and it reduces the amount of virus entering your body when you breathe. Uh, similarly, filtration also removes uh, the virus from the air and it returns uncontaminated air to the spaces. Again, that lowers concentration and it reduces the amount of virus that you breathe in. So th these are sort of the three basic principles that are relating buildings, ventilation, and filtration uh, to reducing uh, the risk of infection. So, the question that we've been asked many times, and by we, I mean, not just myself, but the broader research community and the uh, various groups like ASHRAE has, has its task force and so on. People are always asking how much air is enough air? And there isn't a single answer to this question. I can't tell you exactly how many CFM or how many air changes now is the right amount. So the answer, unfortunately, is as much as you reasonably can. And I, I know that other speakers have addressed this issue uh, today, but you know, I gave a few examples here. Hospital isolation wards, they ventilate a lot, 12 air changes an hour. That's not needed in all buildings all the time. We definitely know that the more people there are, the more you want to ventilate. So you might want to think about increasing the CFM per person metric, which is something that's been used for quite a while for ventilation requirements. Um, we should definitely at least meet the minimum airflows in the various standards. The ASHRAE 62.1 and 62.2 standards are the ones most appropriate for the North American market, but there are others. Um, there are strategies about opening windows and, and other countries are more enthusiastic than this maybe than we are here in the US, but there's a lot of caveats about you know, pressure control in multi-story buildings. And if it's really cold outside, is that a good strategy? I mean, if you live alone, does it make any difference? The answer is if you live alone, then no. But um, if you're looking at more commercial style ventilation systems, you, you can open outdoor air dampers more than the minimum. And there's obviously a, an economic balance here. And you heard earlier about what those economic balances might be. But the thing that's most important, I think, is it's vital to commission your systems. And I think this is a great opportunity for a lot of uh, non-residential buildings in particular, and, and also residential buildings, to make sure your ventilation system is actually working and moving the air you expect, the dampers are functioning properly, that your filters are correctly installed and so on. So to get into more specifics, um, experiments have been done where we know the size of particles that people emit. And these are the particles that contain the virus. And there's a little, there's a little uh, picture here showing when uh, people are coughing, what's the size range, the diameter here is in mic microns. These are all particles you basically cannot see. They are very small, um, but they cover quite a range. And the other, the other chart next to it is a very complex chart. I won't get into the details of it, but they're basically showing depending on the particle size, the diameter here, it's the same scale as here, basically, where do the particles end up in your breathing system? So the larger particles tend to get deposited um, up in the nasal cavity, the smaller particles go deeper into the lungs. 
why this is important is if we're going to pick some sort of filtration system, it's important to know the particle sizes that we're interested in. And based on research by other people, not myself, um, knowing something about the size of particles that's emitted and where they go in the body, we know that if we can capture most of the particles that are bigger than one micron, we're going to make a significant risk reduction. And a MERV-13 filter will do that for you. A lower MERV-13, sorry, lower than MERV-13 filter uh, is not quite as good, and you might want to uh, run an air handler for longer to get the same, same clean air delivery rate. But MERV-13 is kind of at a sweet spot. They're, they're readily available filters. Uh, they're affordable. They remove a whole bunch of other particles that are also harmful, uh, which is a, an excellent benefit. And usually, you don't need to redesign the system you are installing these things in. And it's important to know that you don't need a HEPA filter to make a significant change in the number of airborne uh, viruses. Because the larger particles, as you may imagine, contain a lot more viruses than individual virus floating around. And if we're trying to get our biggest bang for the buck here, it's just not essential to go to HEPA filtration. Just a note on filters, at least in the residential market, uh, we have different ratings, and I just wanted to point out that, you know, MERV-13 is based on ASHRAE standard, but there are other ratings out there by different manufacturers. And I put this, this little bullet list here to give you sort of the equivalence roughly to MERV-13, that if you're out there shopping for filters or you're purchasing filters for, uh, for, a, for a building, these are the sort of filter ratings uh, to look for. It's important to note also that if there's no air flowing through the filter, it doesn't do anything. So you need some sort of minimum runtime to be effective because particularly in residential, for example, heating and cooling, it's only about 20% of the year that the blower is operating. So you need some sort of minimum runtime for these to be effective. And um, when you're replacing uh, filters, particularly in uh, sort of more commercial environments where this is done more often, you have uh, a lot more people and a lot less control over who's there, definitely need to wear your PPE when you're changing these filters and bag them immediately. Now, not all buildings and homes have the ability to do that. There are homes without forced air systems, for example. Uh, what can you do? Well, putting in these small portable air cleaners is actually quite effective. Uh, they usually have HEPA filters, which is more than good enough to remove a lot of the virus particles we're talking about. Um, there are ratings like clean air delivery ratings, uh, more being better. EPA has some great guidance for, for sizing that I recommend you follow. And if you're trying to clean out a larger room, um, often these smaller units are good for something like 300 to 400 square feet, which in a house means you can do a considerable amount of it. But what if you've got a, let's say a classroom, um, you might want to put two of these in there instead of one. There are also larger capacity devices available from uh, many manufacturers that have a lot higher flow rates than these devices, but they're pretty costly and you know they're kind of specific to uh, uh, particular applications, but they're definitely something to consider if you have a larger space that you need to clean, say, of several thousand square feet. Um, I'm only briefly going to talk about the potential energy impacts here. This is the results of some work done by my uh, good friends over at NREL. They did analysis using Comstock, and they're looking at the first column here is, you know, if we did nothing, what would happen? The next column says, what if we add MERV-13 to our commercial buildings? This is a tiny, tiny change in energy. It's probably unmeasurably small. This idea of disabling demand control ventilation, so we're gonna move more air. Again, only minor changes. Really the biggest energy impacts were found if you uh, went to 100% outdoor air all the time. And, uh, or um, we use this idea of flushing buildings with 100% outdoor air rather than doing it all the time. Again, those are the big energy impacts. I'm, I'm not going to say whether or not they are worth it. Again, you've heard more on that topic previously, but it's good to have some sort of idea about which of the various things we're talking about here have the bigger uh, energy impact. So that was for commercial buildings. Here at LBL, we've done some preliminary work for uh, residential buildings. And again, this is, you know, this is national energy using quad. So it's sort of a bit of a, it's hard to sort of conceive what it is for an individual building because you're going to rightly say, well, Having lots of outdoor air in, in Alaska is not the same as lots of outdoor air in San Diego. And of course you are right. I'm just giving a very high level sort of evaluation. So we get a relative feel about what happens if we increase ventilation, say double the 62.2 rate, use air cleaners, upgrade our filters to MERV-13 with minimum run times and so on. And you can see that uh, it is important to actually know what you're doing, right? And um, make sure that you don't, uh, a lot of these things are only small increases, but you know, what if you have leaky ducts? 
that makes a difference and so on. So, it's, so these other factors, you need to know a little bit about your system before you can predict the energy use. And you, it is possible if you, if you do things poorly to actually have a significant impact here. Most of the time, uh, it, it's, not too, it's, it's not a really great difference. So I just give a very, very high level overview here. There's a lot more details available at other places. The ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force has put together lots and lots of information. Um, I will say that a lot of it is in engineer speak and a lot of the questions I've been fielding recently, people who read that guidance are like, so what does that mean? You know, if someone from a school board is trying to read it and understand it to decide what to do in schools. Um, we, I work on the residential team. We've tried to make it use, more user-friendly. And I will say that everyone on this task force, they're aware that they're trying to communicate with lots of different audiences. And there are things like frequently asked questions that take away some of the engineering speak and make it more user-friendly. But I highly recommend um, browsing all the information available that, that ASHRAE has produced. There are other organizations that have produced more guidance, just this is the one I'm familiar with. And certainly for commercial buildings, I think this is really a good go-to place for um, getting some good information. And lastly, on COVID-19, before I switch to other topics, we are asked a lot about, about masks and what exactly is going on here. Without getting into too much detail, there's, there's two key factors. One is that the little shadow graph picture here shows uh, somebody coughing without a mask and with a mask. And you can see how far the cough goes out into the room is substantially reduced by wearing a mask. So when you're in the checkout line at the supermarket and you're, you're six feet away from somebody and they have a mask on, that sort of jet of air that they might have breathed on you doesn't happen anymore because of the mask. And that's really, really an important way to reduce your exposure. So I do like this idea of wearing masks. There can also be a, a, a filter. This is sort of the, the primary reason we often think about masks is um, when you breathe out through a mask, a lot of the big particles are trapped in it. The big particles are the ones that have a lot of the virus in them. So that's kind of important. And that's, that's, sort of, that's protecting other people in the space. Also, when you breathe in through a mask, it filter particles during, in, during inhalation. For that to be effective, you do need a quote unquote better mask. So a bandana is good at you know, getting rid of the big particles that you breathe out. But if you're consider, considering you're protecting yourself from the environment, you do need a better mask and a better fitting mask uh, uh, to protect yourself. Um, but that, that's hard to do on a daily basis. But in, in healthcare situations, that is definitely the case. So I, can't, I cannot overstate enough how important uh, mask wearing is to controlling the spread of the virus. So I'll stop talking there about COVID-19 and move on to some other things. Um, because the world has continued spinning despite COVID, and we've been out in buildings, you know, measuring their ventilation systems and indoor air quality. And I, I touched a little bit on this uh, last year, and I just want to briefly go through some more of our results from what, what we find from going into homes. So this is some data from 70 California homes out of 150 totally. The other, the other homes were in other parts of the country and I'll get to them momentarily. And here in California, we've had ventilation requirements for quite a while now. The typical default in most residential situations is to put in a, an exhaust fan because they're easy to install. They're also easy to verify their air airflow. And I, I mentioned earlier, Commissioning is so important uh, for ventilation systems. They're, they've been kind of neglected for many years. It's important to be able to go and measure things. Uh, so that's why exhaust systems have been used. Um, we found out the, the blue is homes that had the system on, orange with the rough. Unfortunately, most homes had the systems not turned on. And this is a, a labeling and information issue. In most of these homes, people didn't even, either didn't know they had a ventilation system or didn't know what the switch was because it didn't have a label on it. Uh, that's a that's a performance they were going to have to try and work out in the codes and standards world. Um, but when they were turned on, they were like 50% greater than the minimum requirements. So when they were turned on, they did a great job, just they weren't turned on, uh, which is sad, but we're, we're going to work on that. If, if we look in other states, I've got the same breakdown. Again, the, the blue is systems that were on, blue and the orange is systems that were off. And I grouped, I grouped things together. We did several southeastern states, went to Oregon and Colorado. And, this is all part of a Building America program where we have teams throughout the country that LBL is doing some coordination of. And you can see again, there's quite a few times when systems are, are you know, not doing what we want them to do. Uh, 
But I, rather than get into the details of all these flows, I want to sort of have, there were some key takeaways here. And we found out that in these, in these other states, exhaust systems are the simplest and easiest to do, are used less. And guess what? Um, those, the more complex systems were more error prone because they're harder to install and get right. Particularly central fan integrated systems where, there's a, where it's connected to the central cooling and heating system and you have to integrate the controls. Again, we found in other states like California, labeling is not great. And um, we did find that quite a lot of systems did not meet the airflow requirements. The, the horizontal red line in these charts shows where they were supposed to be. Um, in states other than California, we found out that we should really be doing a lot more conditioning, conditioning to make sure we get the right flows. Um, putting all that aside in terms of commissioning and so on. So I think we know what to, we have to commission better, we have to label better, but the potential is there to have good ventilation at home. So that's, that's, that's the key thing. In terms of contaminants, what did we find? If we look at ATHO here is formaldehyde, CO2, I think we all know about, PM2.5 is small particles, and radon is something that is commonly thought of as an indoor contaminant comes out of the, comes out of the ground. We compared homes that didn't have mechanical ventilation, those that did, and we did some flip-flop testing where we took homes and turned things on and off. And we found out that mechanical ventilation, as you might expect, it consistently reduces the average levels of these contaminants. Sometimes not as much as we would like, but again, that depends a little bit on were these systems commissioned and having the right airflows, for example. Uh, but this is just the homes as we found them. And this is not unexpected, but there's always this question asked of, is it even worth turning on your ventilation system? And I would say yes, because you're reducing the contaminant concentrations. Moving away from that field work that is sort of uh, gonna be used a whole bunch in, in standards development, I think in the future, and maybe next year I'll, I'll talk to in some more detail about the analyses we're doing there. I want to talk a little bit about building electrification and why there's some interesting IAQ advantages. Because um, the primary motivation for building electrification is to reduce the CO2 emissions uh, for heating, cooling, making hot water, turning on the lights, whatever. But um, CO2 is mostly emitted from making hot water, heating, and, uh, and cooking. They're the primary things where we're burning fossil fuels in the house. And it's a truism, we, just, we can't efficiency out fossil fuel use. If you can have a super efficient gas furnace or water heater, but they still use plenty of fossil fuels. We're not going to get to a gas furnace that's better than 100% efficient. Um, so there are some sort of energy efficiency uh, way, reasons why we're going to remove fossil fuel burning from the home, but the IAQ impacts are important. We're removing the sources of key contaminants. Uh, uh, NO2 and particles, and there are other things like acrolein associated with burning gas that we um, have to worry about. Carbon monoxide is not generally thought of as a ventilation issue because um, it generally happens with some sort of equipment failure and a whole bunch of other things need to go wrong in your home for you to get CO poisoning. Um, but if you don't combust things in the home, this is an important safety issue, right? You don't need CO, CO monitors. You Basically, you are eliminating the risk of CO poisoning in a home. And this is something that's taken very seriously in codes and standards for those of you that are familiar with them uh, in terms of uh, building safety. And we, we don't need to go around doing combustion safety testing when we don't have combustion. And this, this has been an issue where, you know, when people have talked about going into buildings and homes and fixing envelope leaks and sealing them for energy reasons, a big drawback has been people's concerns about, well, you know, is this, um, am I, is my furnace or water heater still going to draft properly when I seal up the building? And then you have to test. And that's, you know, it's a risk that people are concerned about when we seal up homes, particularly if we add ventilation in terms of kitchen and bathroom exhaust fans that weren't already in a, in a home. Uh, and if we go to electric appliances rather than fossil fuel ones, we are basically uh, reducing and eliminating these risks um, associated with these sort of energy efficiency and other good IAQ measures. So that's some, it has some big advantages there. And certainly uh, here in California, where we've been discussing things like kitchen ventilation, which is the next topic here, this issue of if you use electric cooking, particularly induction cooking, where things don't, you don't have hot heating elements, so you're not emitting as many particles anymore. Um, there's sort of a double benefit. There's both an efficiency and a, a health benefit from doing that. So speaking of kitchen ventilation, we've made some um, progress in the, in the last year or so. Um, 
the little the little sketch on the left there is showing this idea of if um, you get some emissions from the cooktop, if 40% of it goes in the little microwave hood there that has a fan in it and is blown outside, the other 60% goes in the room, you get to breathe that 60% and we'd like to make that 60% smaller. And so our capture efficiency rating is this idea of if 40% of the uh, contaminants from the cooking get exhausted to outside, that's a 40% capture efficiency. Um, we've been working with uh, organizations like HBI and AHAM um, on this to get devices rated. And there are some, there's some questions we're still sort of hammering out because there's issues about our, should sound ratings be done at the same flow as capture efficiency and so on. The usual sort of um, codes and standard certification issues that we run into, but uh, those things are slowly being ironed out. And to give you sort of a flavor of, of what happens when we measure this, we've, we've done a bunch of laboratory tests using an ASTM test method that LBL developed in partnership with um, the major manufacturers of exhaust hoods and other indoor air quality experts. And this is just sort of give you an idea, at, you know, as you increase airflow, as you might imagine, capture efficiency gets better. We very rarely get to 100%. And at the typical current practice around 100 CFM, we're down in the, uh, although there's not very much data on this chart, which I apologize for, we're talking about, you know, 50 to 60% capture efficiency. So only half of the contaminants um, are removed by the 100 CFM that we have as a current minimum. And there's some debate about whether or not that should get changed. There are proposals, and I emphasize these are proposals only in California. This is not um, officially part of Title 24, for those of you that are familiar with it, um, that are currently being discussed. Um, I believe if these are adopted in California, actually 622 will follow very closely. Um, as I mentioned, um, HVI and AHAM are beginning to do ratings of hoods. Uh, this is, there's ideas about, well, um, natural gas combustion emits a lot more things like NO2, the electric heat does not, and we might require better performance of devices. And the table below is, um, you know, splitting up the performance we think we require for both electric and gas. Um, we probably want to scale things with bigger homes because bigger homes have more dilution, just more space in terms of for an individual's exposure. Um, and this chart here is based on a bunch of calculations so that if you have that size home with either the gas or electric uh, cooking, what sort of capture efficiency makes people's exposures equivalent? Now, it may well be that this level of breakdown is too complex for a building code. In other words, having builders trying to figure out, do I have to buy a different range or depending on the size of the building might be a, a step too far. Um, but this sort of gives you an idea of how much capture efficiency would change between electric and gas. You can see gas needs to be higher, smaller homes need also higher. And we also figured out some sort of equivalent airflows for a typical hood um, as an alternative to capture efficiency rating. You can see, boy oh boy, it's, it's challenging to make a small apartment with gas cooking have equivalent exposure for the occupants as a large home with electric cooking, like, you know, um, more than a factor of two and a half difference. So these are preliminary things that we're talking about, but this is just to give you sort of a flavor uh, of where we're going with uh, kitchen ventilation. And I'm gonna finish up here just sort of with a, a bit of an overview of uh, what I've talked about for the last half an hour. Um, we have a lot of uh, COVID-19 concerns, obviously, and guidance is continually developing. I think there's, there's important things like really, we've got to commission our systems and make sure they're doing what we think they are doing. Uh, that should be anyone's first step. Um, wearing masks is important, but in terms of buildings and ventilation, more ventilation is better. Of course, there's maybe some energy and economic trade-offs, but those are things that, you know, kind of specific for an individual building. Um, I think overall, probably the, uh, if you don't do crazy things, uh, the energy and economic impacts are small. There's also economic impacts about if you keep people healthier, that's a huge positive benefit, right? Um, we should definitely use good filters. Um, MERV 13 is sort of where we've landed as sort of the, uh, the, the, the place to be. You could put in a lower MERV filter, but you might have to move more air and accept a slightly higher risk. But some of these things are kind of marginal and work is ongoing in that area. Uh, my colleagues at LBL and some other national labs are doing uh, laboratory testing on some theoretical work on, you know, how much you might need to change the airflow for different filtration conditions. Um, in terms of household residential ventilation, the key thing seems to be 
um, simpler systems are easier to install and get right. So keep it simple um, um, and label that switch. Electrification of, of homes and buildings in general, it's a great opportunity to reduce your indirect quality risks. And lastly, the last thing I talked, talked about uh, from the world of ventilation, about ventilating kitchens. And I was slowly changing the industry over to a capture efficiency metric and possibly will treat gas and electric cooking differently because of the different emission profiles. And I will um, stop there and Thank take you, any- Thank you, that was a great questions. talk. And I'm sure if you could hear the, uh, the participants, you'd hear applause in the background. We have a few questions that have come in. The first question that came in uh, noted that the MRF 13 sounds like a reasonable measure, but what about for older commercial buildings that have had multiple mod modifications over the years uh, that impact airflow and for creating air spaces that are not exhausted? Um, can you give a sense of uh, the kind of testing that's needed, to, uh, the kind of correction, you know, what testing would be appropriate, how to make the cut corrections and what other measures besides MERV 13 could be implemented? Sure, so uh, yeah, beyond filtration, there, there's just sort of general commissioning in terms of knowing what the system in the building is doing. Typically that's a matter of measuring airflows. And it's true that, you know, uh, you know, a modern brand new system might have airflow stations built in and, and some, some really nice uh, built in uh, controls and so on. You just go to a panel and it tells you the airflow and all the systems will not have that. And then you sort of back to, back to HVAC basics, right? You're, you're putting in um, airflow traverses to measure airflow or you're measuring the flow at inlet and outlet terminals. And yeah, I, I agree it is, is challenging. If you wanna know the airflow at an inlet that's mounted high up on the facade of a building, that's painful. Right, but uh, maybe you can get access to the ducts inside. Um, and I don't really have anything more specific than that, that it's, uh, no matter how difficult it is, we need to try our best to commission our systems, know what our airflows are doing and so on. But in terms of updating existing systems, um, yeah, they, they can be tricky because you might not have access, it can be very expensive. And then you have to maybe look into alternatives like installing temporary filtration, like, like portable filters, for example. Um, installing temporary fans. I, I've been talking with um, City of Berkeley about this. They had these similar concerns where they had rooms in their main office building that basically had little or no ventilation. And we talked about what could you do about some, you know, simple through the wall and uh, exhaust or supply fans that they could install that uh, would, would allow them to add some ventilation to those spaces. So those are all possible. Um, there's also uh, talk about, you probably many of you listening in have heard about ultraviolet uh, air treatment. When, you know, if, if you don't have any other options, maybe you can install some ultraviolet air cleaning. And um, that's certainly doable, right? There are, there are induct systems, there are systems that sort of mount upon the wall. Um, my, my caveat with that is that uh, to do it right, you need to be kind of careful, right? Um, you need to make sure that that UV never shines on you and that they engineer that there are there's some proper engineering practice being followed and uh, it's not a DIY thing right you need to because UV can be dangerous I need to emphasize that you, you should seek professional advice before using UV that is for sure but that is an, often an option for you know high occupancy spaces in a legacy building that's hard to treat with more air or more ventilation and um, I'm sorry, I rambled a bit there. I was trying to like tease out maybe something from the question that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what about uh, the different, oh, is there a good source for uh, indoor air quality monitors uh, specifically for households? And it, are mm -hmm. there some that are better or more cost effective than others? Sure. So in terms of specifically detecting a virus like COVID-19, for example, there, there is no household option. Uh, and frankly, um, if you want to measure things in real time, there are, I know there are some experimental devices out there, but they are far from being readily available either for the residential or commercial applications about detecting a virus directly. But we know that um, the viruses are inside particles that are in the air. And, the, and we know something about the particle sizes, as I said, 
you know, people in the medical profession have measured the particles that people emit, we know something about them, hence the recommendation from Rev 13. So you could legitimately think about, well, if I can measure particles well, I can have an idea about how well I'm cleaning the air from a, say, a COVID-19 perspective. But of course, this applies to non-COVID-19 particles that you also don't want to be breathing. So generally- That's also uh, the yes. question, are there monitors for other things that you yeah. can recommend so, that are useful? So what I'm getting to is that the monitors that are good at measuring small particles are, are a good indicator for you know, particles in general, but also possibly for COVID-19. Now, indeed, um, the, there are some you know, lower cost devices that are okay at measuring particles. The reason why I'm hesitant to say, yeah, just, just buy one of these devices, put it in your home or your office or your school, and if it says zero, you're fine. I'm hesitant to say that because uh, not all devices are created equal and without ratings, it's hard to know. And yes, at LBL, we have tested them and you can read our publications on it, but also as a US DOE government employee, I can't tell you buy this brand of device, right? So until there are ratings in place, it's kind of tricky, but we do know that some, some devices are pretty good. I will say there's an enormous caveat though. Um, the, those devices don't detect uh, submicron particles at all, the low cost ones. And, you know, uh, we have to be, we have to err on the side of caution. I think you could learn something useful from that and it would be an indicator of better air quality and an indicator of lower risk. But no way would I say that if you use one of the devices and it read low, that definitely you've eliminated the risk from COVID. I would never say that. But it would tell you how, effective you, how effectively your air filtration system is working, say for a MERV 13 filter. Okay. So I'm, I'm sorry to give like, a very non-committal answer to that, but um, I, I think it's the truth. I think we we simply can't say it is a good guide, but it's no absolute, uh, you know, uh, truth in terms of saying you know your risk will be, your risk will be eliminated if this device is zero particles. Okay, we have three more questions in about three minutes, so we'll this okay. will be our lightning round. Uh, opinion of opening windows versus me mechanical ventilation. Um, well, I think window opening is the best option if you don't have mechanical ventilation, uh, but severely weather restricted, obviously, and, um, and, in, and in, you know, large high rise buildings, I would not recommend it because I think you uh, disturb the mechanical flows inside the building to such an extent that uh, airflow control becomes almost impossible. But if it's a nice day and you can open the windows, then do so. It's more important to do so if you come if you have more people in the space like a classroom might have would have a bigger advantage to window opening than say at my house i i'm here in my house alone opening the windows won't change my risk of infection but in a classroom it could great um a few microwave designs have pull out filters do they have a better capture efficiency okay so i i think this question is related to some uh kitchen hoods don't blow the air outside, they recirculate it into the room. And by and large, we don't recommend that for a host of reasons. Uh, you could put in great filters, but we need really good filters to remove the particles and you would have to change them regularly. And you still can't filter out, say, uh, NO2 or acrolein from burning natural gas. It's very difficult to filter out the ultrafine particles um, that you get from hot electric coil or gas. So I don't recommend recirculation at all. A range hood should exhaust to outside. There are some possibilities that are being looked at for recirculating range hoods that have better filters and have carbon filters in them to remove odors also. Um, but you know that's a lot of filter maintenance. So there are devices out there that could work, uh, but they're rare, I will say. Like your standard microwave that you have in your kitchen at home does not have adequate filtration for cleaning the air from the point of view of cooking. Okay, uh, the last question um, it looks at multifamily housing and uses uh, cigarette smoke as, a, as an example of how airflow can travel between units um, and suggests that if cigarette smoke is traveling then other contaminants may be traveling as well. And they, the questioner notes that this is especially problematic in subsidized housing. So the question is, would it make sense to do air or draft sealing between units to prevent the spread of contaminants? And are there any programs to do this that you're aware of? Right. It surely does make sense to do so uh, for a whole host of reasons, indoor air quality, energy, every, 
Everything is better in multifamily, um, the better the compartmentalization by compound, sorry, compartmentalization. Even I can't say it, it's kind of awkward. What we mean is um, the leakage that isn't directly to outside that's connecting you to hallways and other units, you want that as tight as possible. It's incredibly difficult in a retrofit situation. Although I know people, there are, there are people who have, how I've done it. There aren't many programs specifically. There are some technologies like the, uh, there's an aerosol sealant technology uh, that's available, but that really is best done when there's nothing in the house, no furnishings, no carpet or anything. So if you're doing a gut rehab, sure. Uh, but otherwise there's simple stuff like, you know, looking underneath the kitchen cupboards and sealing around all the plumbing, uh, finding all the electrical penetrations and sealing them up. You can do some small stuff like that, but it's heroically difficult um, I highly encourage a new construction getting as tight as possible. And uh, in fact, the, um, we're going to be updating the ASHRAE 622 standard um, for multifamily, and we're going to almost certainly be changing our uh, compartmentalization requirements. And unfortunately, we, don't, we just don't have very strict compartmentalization requirements here in the US, which is why we have so much communication between units and multifamily. Um, so the, the answer is, is not a great one, but basically it's, it's, it's the same as air sealing the envelope to outside. We need to air seal interior too. And the techniques and things, technologies we use are the same, right? You've got to go around with your, your cork gun and your sealant tape and find all those cracks if you can, or as much as you can. And one last thing I will say on this topic is, has to do with um, in some multifamily, more so in high rise, there are sometimes things like common exhaust or common supply fans where they're ducted to multiple units with dampers and so on. Um, again, I'm gonna bang on the drum of commissioning. If you have such a building, you better make sure those dampers are functioning properly so that you aren't having air motion uh, between uh, individual units via the ducts that are supposed to be either supplying or exhausting your air. Great, thank you very much. And, and I, again, would echo the, the audience. Thank you for your, your talk and for your great answers. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks everybody for listening. Pleasure.